Hey guys, welcome back. It is your favorite Gimp with a Limp, and we are back with some more Absolute Victory. We're going to get jumped right back in here. A few things did happen after our previous turn in the Pacific. We'll go over those uh, here in just a second. It wasn't too much that I did off camera. I did not take and really do a full like end of turn thing. Because normally you would have recruitment and extra units are coming on the board and stuff like that. And I wasn't really sure that that should go ahead and happen since this was just kind of a special turn just for like Pearl Harbor to happen. So I did not do any recruitment over here or anything like that since normally you would have that extra infantry and tanks and everything coming out. I figured we're not going to have that happen since especially all the units over here, this is what's supposed to start in this scenario, the European scenario is supposed to start at this time, this turn, and all the units are out. So I figure we'll hit this, which we did, and then have everything kick off. So now we're into the first real turn of the game where everything, whole world can be involved, all of it can be moved, all of it can be touched, all that good stuff. A uh, couple things, like I'd mentioned in some previous videos, when it comes to the the variants, the smaller little minutia, I am going to try to stick in one or two here or there, but I'm not going to overly worry about the variants. They're in the the back of these little booklets, these small little uh, one-offs. They can get a little unwieldy, and it's a lot to try to remember, even with the markers. And I'm wanting to try to stick to the the foundation of the game itself. We're going to have plenty going on with the events, all the other good stuff that's going to happen, the main stuff, the, the armies warring against each other. But I'm not going to worry about small, tiny rules because there's a good chance that, you know, I'd show you the rule and then forget about it later on, even with a marker. So we'll do the, the bigger ones, but we're not going to worry about smaller ones. Oh, and one other little thing before we get started over here, when it comes to minor nations, so these little counters here, stuff like that. The the smaller, not Britain or Russia, Germany, America, Japan, you know, the, the main major powers involved. The minor ones, a lot of them do have their own little units and some of them can move around in different places and some of them can't. And for this, we're just not going to worry about it. Everybody can go wherever the hell they want. It'll make it a hell of a lot easier than having to try to keep track of who can go where and why all the other good stuff. And besides, I've always been a big fan of if the unit's on the board and I'm gonna move it, I'm gonna move it. So we're gonna go with that direction on things. So let's get uh, started with everything just to show you here, the uh, Pacific, not a whole lot did happen here. Uh, the Japanese did push down a little bit farther into some of these garrisons. They're gonna try to use their forces to continue taking out these areas. They had pushed down here, they pushed here. And I'm not sure if these red communist forces are opposed or not to the Japanese. Yeah, I think they are, but I left some defensive forces there just in case. So the Japanese are kind of gonna spread out and try to take over China and get them wiped out. They do have a nice little line of garrisons here to defend, even if the KMT tried to push back. So uh, they're pretty good there. We did have the Japanese forces here that made their amphibious landing. They're going to make an attack later on in this turn. And we've got some spare forces up here to do some invasions. We did come down into the Netherlands East Indies. There was a surrender city here, a major city. And the thing is, the Netherlands are already considered conquered. So I don't think this uh, matters. So I don't think it's going to change anything as far as they're concerned, but it felt kind of good to take it from them anyway. So the Japanese have control of that. And I think I'm going to try to recreate kind of what the, the Japanese did real world. I mean, you don't have to worry about supply in this game. There are rules when it comes to oil, right? You can have that in the game if you really want to get into that level of minutia. We're not going to get that deep into it. But it is there if you want to have that, which would definitely give the Japanese a bigger incentive for coming down into this area. But we are going to try to do that like they did historically, sweep in and try to take control of these islands, moving around. And with the Americas, I had them push up. They don't have a whole lot of ground forces yet. They've got a decent sized Navy left. They lost 
some of their forces, but not all of it. I split what was remaining at Pearl Harbor into two task force. They're both here. So we've got four like little naval task force. And again, I'm trying to do it kind of like how they talked about in the rule book that too many people were too aggressive with their naval forces and they would have these huge big battles and they would battle out until neither side had a navy left and there was nothing uh, left fighting over control of seas. So I divided them into smaller groups of two or three ships. So uh, an aircraft carrier with few battleships, something like that, uh, especially since the aircraft carrier gives them the ability to patrol out at range and intercept. And you'll notice they're just a couple of hexes away from each other. So they're right there on that border. These ships are looking over Midway. This one's trying to keep an eye on the marshals, but the Japanese are down there. So any hex farther in any direction and these ships can start intercepting each other. But I kind of went with the same thing, uh, at least an aircraft carrier in each one of the little fleets and some battleships, that way they can have some decent battles. And there's a couple left up here in America that can get involved later on as some uh, defensive forces. But I'm gonna try to recruit some Marines at the end of this turn and see if we can send them in. All right, but we're gonna start first here in Europe and do some ground battles since uh, you guys haven't got to see much of Europe getting involved just yet. And I did redeploy some of Great Britain because I went and I looked up the special rules for Operation Silo or Sea Lion, which is the German invasion of Great Britain. And since, of course, this is a war game and some of it's abstracted, if I had left their deployment alone, Great Britain probably would have been wiped off the map very quickly. <laughs> so I changed that around a little bit so there would be a fight and they would have to, the Germans would have to figure something out. But they've got plenty of forces. They have a much, much, much weaker Navy here, but if they use it correctly, they might be able to, you know, do something over here. But I did move some naval forces into the channel because they, they were there historically anyway. They need to be there to, to do their thing. And I think we can send some air attacks after their their naval forces as well to kind of simulate the Battle of Britain, see if we can cause some damage that way with the Germans. And then over here, we're gonna do, this is probably where we're gonna start with the, the German push into the Soviet Union. Again, the Germans have kind of bunched their forces up against the line, real strong line that they're gonna to try to punch forward with, you know, Blitzkrieg. The Russians, I did a more defense in depth. So as they're taking losses, there's still lines behind. There's still units back there that are trying to hold the, the Germans back. So they, if they go punching just straight forward and try to hit just for the, uh, the surrender cities, which are the ones that have the red circles around them, then they can be cut off and isolated. So they're gonna have to kind of clear everything as they go. But the Soviets do have to worry about the Finnish forces up there, which are allied with Nazi Germany. And those guys are actually pretty damn good. And the Soviet forces are not upgraded yet. So they're still all like 1-1. One, one. They're very, uh, very, very weak forces to start off with. Although the, the American forces are weak too. They do have some elite units back here in the back that are a little bit better, but they don't have too many of those. And we do have a little bit going on here in North Africa as well. Few German forces with some Italian forces that are stacked underneath uh, that are going to fight the British. And for some reason, Polish units. I didn't even know there were Polish units uh, in North Africa. You guys let me know about that. But uh, Polish units, uh, South African units were allied in up here, evidently. Um, I forget the, the name of that one. The Commonwealth, Australian units, they were all told to be um, deployed here. So I was like, all right, I guess they were there historically, but there is a, a good chunk of Commonwealth British type forces here. And then there's one little um, uh, advanced guard, I guess you could say, over this way. So the Germans are going to push through and try to take them out and keep pushing over and see if they can take control of Egypt over here. So they'll have all of North Africa. To start, we do have on the back of the rule book a sequence of play. And the big thing that we're gonna have to start with is the role for weather. 
most of this other stuff's not going to apply. The election stage, we're not there yet. And then we're going to be going to the warfare stage, which is alternating pulses. So that is the uh, the big thing that we're going to be on right now. So let's roll for our weather. Let you guys see how that goes. And again, that's where this little booklet comes in. So let me slide over here and roll. And we got a three. All right. So again, I have to pan across and three. All right. So that's our little weather marker. Keeps track of where we're at. We're not worrying about Antarctica right now. A storm marker. And that means we are using chart three. And we're in January, February. So we're right here. And we're going to be operating in the temperate or continental area. And both of those are snow. So I think that is two. Yeah, two movement points. Everyone gets four. So basically movement is cut in half right now as far as that's concerned. Well, it's, it's not horrible. It's kind of different way to handle the weather, but uh, is what it is. Okay, so I got us set up for combat. Like I said, we're going to start here and I'm trying to figure out who I want to attack first because they're just, they're all bunched up here along the line. Can't go across there because there's a blocked head side, so I missed that earlier. So I'm thinking, where's my long set of tweezers? Maybe here over, here over. I don't want to push here, like I said, because that can cause some issues if they get isolated. And I don't want them to get isolated. Or maybe even here up. Yeah. Although, yeah, because actually that would link me up with the Finnish forces. That would be a good idea. And these are Soviet ships. This is not infantry up there. So if we go here first, that would be good. Now, like I said, there are rules for like assistance. So if this group is attacking here, this group would contribute like a bonus to them for being adjacent to the hex that's being attacked. Uh, that's an optional rule, and we're not including the optional rule on this. So it's just the units that are going to be involved. So remember, when we have a combat, a land combat take effect, you take both sides, take them to that front, the, the player aid, and then you mark the hex where the battle's taking place with a marker. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so I got to set up for combat. Took me a sec because I wanted to go over the rules again. This one, I'm always trying to make sure I got it right because there's there's a lot of moving parts here. Now, to try to make this a little bit easier, we're just going to abstain from any aircraft for some of these first uh, land combats just to let you see what's going on. Besides, the Germans already have an advantage, a pretty severe advantage. If we throw the aircraft in it because the Soviet Union has less, it's just going to be even worse <laughs> against them. So we're going to try to go... Uh, without aircraft, let you see just the base land combat. Now, since we're playing solo, we have to determine the land mode grid. Okay, let me pull it over here because I'm gonna have this magnified so you guys can see the counters easier. With the land mode grid, I went ahead and wrote across the top the, the numbers for the roll, okay? Because <clears throat> the attacker is going to choose one of these attacks and then we're going to roll to see what the defense mode is going to be for the defender. Uh, I am going to go with normal attack. I'm probably going to generally stick with, uh, stick with normal attack since that is, you know, middle of the road. And I really have no idea what this is going to be. So let's roll a 10 sided die and see what they're going to have. They're going to have five, which is going to be balanced defense. We're going to be right here in the center. That works out nicely for us, but we have some other modifiers. Since it is snowing, we have a negative one applied to our violence number. Our violence number here is three for the attacker, fourth for the defender, which means it's two for the attacker. You need to roll a two or under on a D10 to get a, a hit. Not going to be a whole lot of hits for the attacker. We're going to attack simultaneously. There's a retreat times two, and the attacker will flip on hits, which means if the attacker's hit at all, that they're going to be flipping and not able to continue because let's say the attacker did not flip, 
We've got four movement points. We spent two to move into that hex, okay? And that's, we spend two because it's snowing. Once we were done, we'd have two left. We could move again and continue our attack as long as we had the movement points to do so. In this case, we probably won't have the movement points to do so. So let's do this and again, show you guys how I have the units set up here. The infantry I've got on the left. Remember, they can only go in a box that has one of those little squares on it. And that means you have to leave the space to a, uh, next to an infantry blank. I did that all the way across the board, but you notice, oop, I put this guy in the wrong spot. I did put the, the tank in the wrong spot, but a tank could have a infantry unit right here, or not necessarily an infantry, but another unit right there, okay? So they can be next to each other. Tanks can, um, ships can, stuff like that. Infantry, got to leave the space because they take up so much more space. Now, again, looking at our numbers, our German infantry are far superior to the Soviet infantry. Germans have a two violence number, which means they roll two on their attack. And they have a four on their fortitude, which means it takes four hits just to shatter them. The Soviet units only have a one for their violence number, which means they're rolling four dice total for their entire attack. Okay. They would have to succeed with every roll just to shatter one unit. That's the difference. The German units, if they succeed with just one roll, they can shatter one of the Soviet Union uh, units. And if there's two successes, they can just outright kill them. So you see, getting these Soviet units upgraded, which is going to take a lot of turns. I don't even think we're going to play long enough <laughs> to see them uh, do it because we're talking nine turns from now before they're going to be upgraded. Uh, and it makes a huge difference. It doubles the amount of damage that they can take. Tanks do have the ability to do more damage but it's only in certain circumstances. It has to be clear weather and it has to be a clear terrain hex. The hex that these guys in are in is swampy, so he would not get the bonus either way. It's snowing and it's uh, not the right terrain. So otherwise, eh. if he was getting the bonus, he would have a four, four instead of a two, four. So he'd be rolling four dice. All right, we're gonna roll for the Soviets first since they've only got four dice, it will make it a lot easier again. Their violence number is normally a four, but it's dropped to a three because of the weather. So they're looking for threes or under on their dice. And wow, they actually got a couple of hits. Not too bad, not too bad. Not enough to do anything, but it will cause the attackers to flip, which is nice. And the attackers would have been flipping anyway since they failed their tech, but two, four, six, eight dice on the attack. Let's see, what is that? Here we go. Eight, but it needs to be a two or under. And I'm playing this with the zero being 10. So they've only got two numbers that they can succeed with here. So not good odds, 20% chance. And one was here. And yep, that was it. They got one single hit, which strangely enough, they did half as much damage, but they were able to actually damage one of the units. So one of our Soviet units will be going to the Shattered Remnants box. Remember, the Shattered Remnants can be repaired and brought back in the game a lot easier. You can bring back three Shattered units for every one new unit you produce onto the board. So it is good to have the, the Shattered ones. We're going to put him in the box and the rest of these guys are going to go back to the board. Oh, and before we do take them back, yes, they did take two hits, but with a fortitude of four, that's not enough to do anything to them. They did take hits, so they'll flip, but uh, you need to do at least four hits to at least shatter a unit. Okay, so we have finished our first German impulse. Nice. You can see they have the uh, yellow bead on them. That's to signify the fact that they are flipped currently. The defenders did not have to flip but they do have one less unit there now to actually defend. But we could attack with the next one, although it is the uh, UN, the allied side to do something, they get to conduct a pulse at this point. All right, so before we do the Soviet, or no, 
the Soviet, but the UN pulse. Uh, you guys let me know something. I just had a little thought cross my mind. Uh, the way this game is, the its scope, its size, if I film every aspect, every single battle, everything across the board, I'm not going to be able to get through maybe two turns at most just because it'll take so many videos uh, to film the th thing. There's just so much moving back and forth and little things that you have to worry about with this game. So I was thinking I might take and film portions of it like I'm doing now and then play through a good portion off camera because I can go five times as fast when I'm not having to, to film it and worry about lighting and all the other stuff. That way I'm hitting snips and pieces of each one of the turns. That way I can get through more and show you guys a bigger portion of the game. Let me know down in the comments if you guys would prefer that or if you'd rather just see everything and see less, but see more of less, if you guys get what I'm saying. All right, so I was thinking about it and I'm like, all right, what are the Soviets gonna do? They can't really go on the attack because if they go on the attack, they're, they're giving up that defensive bonus. Generally speaking, the violence number is always going to be better for the defenders than it is for the attackers. And they're they're not going to win the attack. They'll just destroy their forces. I'm like, oh, wait, I can garrison. So I think pretty much this whole round, this whole turn is going to be just pulling garrison moves with every unit that I can. Because that will get as many extra bonus units on the board as I can. Uh, underneath there. I just need to check to make sure there aren't any other garrisons under there, but I don't believe there are. Okay, so yeah, I looked and it looks like most of these units do not have garrison units. And those are the ones that have the G's like that underneath them. But you can only build what is in the, the box itself, right? You can't build extra stuff. And the Soviets just don't have that many garrison infantry units which is kind of unfortunate. They've got stacks of actual infantry counters, of course, but they don't have that many uh, garrisons. So I'm going to be rebuilding lots of garrisons, I think, uh, as we go through this. So, see, they have three, they have three, 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 three. I think it's three across the board. So, damn, it doesn't really matter where, because I can skirt around them. Um, yeah, we'll start here. The one that was just attacked, actually, since they're surrounded by the finish as well, they'll do a garrison pulse right here. All right, you guys remember a garrison pulse goes right here. Let's see if they succeed. Five. Oh, they got a freebie. So it did not even cost them to activate. And I grabbed out, this is it. This is all the garrison units they've got, so they can throw them on the line, and as they die, rebuild them. Remember, garrison are like infantry that cannot move. So we're going to be creating these all across the board. Now, give me one sec. I'm going to throw it underneath that stack. And remember, when you're creating garrison units and doing them, you always want to put them on the bottom because they can't move. You will never attack with a garrison unit. It's only there for defense. So let's... Uh, we're getting close to the end of the video. Let's conduct one more attack on camera and we'll just go right down the line. We'll do the next German unit. And again, they're trying to clear this out so they can go around. So they'll attack the unit that just activated to garrison. That way, if they are wiped out, <laughs> then uh, that garrison will free up to be put into one of these hexes. All right, so give me a sec. Let me move the units over there. All right, we're back doing the same thing we just did a second ago. Again, we're going to run this without aircraft, keeping it basic. Garrison units always have to be part of the combat. They can never be held back in reserve. So if you have garrison units in the hex, make sure you remember to always keep them there. We're going to stick again with normal attack as the base. Let's see what type of defense they're going to throw. Five, which again is going to be the normal balanced defense. With it still being snow, still low violence numbers. Not expecting a whole lot of attacks going back and forth on this one. We'll do the Soviets first again, since they do only have four dice. They're looking for three or under, and they got nothing. Whoa, very bad for them. Uh, Germans going, they're rolling eight, and they are looking for uh, two or under. So again, it's gonna be hard to get a big hit on this one. Uh, they got, oh, they got three, no, four. Oh, no. Oh, they crushed them. Oh, they crushed, crushed, crushed. Okay, now we got some options, okay? 
So when it comes to this, a garrison unit cannot be shattered, or it cannot be uh, destroyed. It can only be shattered. It's a, effectively a one-step unit, okay? Which way do I want to do this? Since there's four hits, I could kill two of the generic infantry, just flat out kill them. They're not in the shattered remnants. They're just dead. They have to be rebuilt from scratch. Or I could take and I would have to shatter all of them, which would suck. It would empty out the hex. It would make it to where these guys would come back quicker. Huh. There are choices. But to slow them down, what I could do is, oh no, they're going to be forced to retreat. They're, yeah, they're going to be forced to retreat since, and the other probably should have been for, no, they got more hits on that, on that previous attack. So yeah, they're going to be forced to retreat. So if they're going to be forced to retreat, I should probably have the strongest or have the most amount stick around as possible. The garrison's going to have to go, which is going to take care of a single hit. And I could destroy one, shatter another. That takes care of four hits, leaving one infantry that can retreat into a uh, adjacent hex. And again, no damage to the German forces. Oh, it's so brutal. So brutal. They're just going to ruffle stop them. Okay, so we're back over there. The Russian forces have retreated. The remaining ones, the German forces pushed forward into that hex. They gained control. We got them marked. Now, I know some of you guys are probably thinking, well, I mean, the Germans are just going to own everybody. You got to remember, there is a huge production difference at the end of these turns that can swing the balance. So you can think of the stronger forces like the, the German units here, they're real strong, but they're more like space marines. You don't have as many, although there's plenty here. They're all the hell over everywhere. You don't have as many, though, but they're very strong units. The Soviet units are more like the orcs. They're not as good, but they're plentiful. When we get into the production logistical phase and they're actually doing recruiting, the Germans only get two infantry units. That's it. Just two. So they can either bring back or create two new units or bring back up to six shattered units. OK, the Soviets get anywhere up to nine, I think it is, depending on how many certain cities they control. But generally, they can bring back up to nine or build up to nine new units on the board or up to what would that be? Twenty seven shattered infantry can come back. So they can bring back a huge amount of infantry in a short amount of time, relatively speaking. So that's where you're going to see a lot of those differences. And it's especially going to make a difference when they upgrade and they're no longer at two or one for their fortitude. They're at two and they don't take damage quite as quickly. All right. So we're going to pause here. We've been playing for a little while. I got a lot of raw footage. I've got to ed uh, edit down. Uh, I, you guys do let me know, though, because I think... The majority would probably appreciate it more if I played some off camera. Like I said, it just takes so long to play it and film it versus just play through the game and then film parts of it as we go. Film some of the attacks, some of the bigger things. Like if we do Operation Silo, film that. But some of these generic attacks as we're just pushing through here, maybe not film all those, get some of those done off camera uh, so we can get a little farther in the game. You guys let me know what you want to see, all right? It's up to you guys. I'm, I'm here for you. I'm working for you all. Y'all take care. I'll catch you in the next one.